All right, let's get started. Welcome to Robotics 311. This is lecture four. Today we're going to kind of do a few things. We're partly we're going to kind of re-go over some of the stuff we went through yesterday to make sure everyone's got it. Um, it's, the class kind of, because there were some challenges with some people's images, you guys kind of spread out across like what you were doing. So a lot of you got all the way through, but some people didn't. So I want to make sure we spend the time to go through some of that stuff and make sure you guys know it. it's really important. So the stuff you were learning in lab yesterday are kind of the building blocks of how you interface with the ball bot for the rest of the semester. So a little bit of what we're going to do is so we're going to review some of lab two. I'm going to show you how to adjust settings in Raspberry config. We didn't really do that, or at least I don't think most people got to that. Um, I'm going to make sure you guys see the file structure so you guys know kind of where things are laid out. We'll end up coming back to that, but at least for now, so you're comfortable when you log in what you're looking at. We'll go over a couple of uh, common commands. Then we're going to like re-go over, review quickly the ball bot mechanics, do the motor selection MATLAB code, and I'm going to walk you through that the code that actually does the prediction of current and voltage. So we'll do kind of an exercise there. And then if we can, the last part is I have an example that we can all work together that's involved in the specking of a motor for a catapult robot that launches a ball. So that would be very similar to your homework problem. So this would be a way to kind of do that. A, a, a problem is very similar together as a group. And then after that, if we get to it, which I don't think we will, we would do thermal analysis. OK, so let's talk through a little bit of lab yesterday. I'm going to kind of, we're going to talk through these, uh, these different questions. What do we do with get actions? What is get actions? Why do we use it? So many have to raise your hand. We're going to go through all of these. Yeah. It's like the, it actually allows the code to be built and like work through or like run through a, a script. We use it to build the Raspberry Pi. And why did we use it? Why do we do the get actions approach as opposed to me just giving you a .img file that you all download? For each user. We want a custom configuration. So we wanted each of you to have your own potential Wi-Fi networks in there, your emails. That's right. Um, it also serves the purpose of keeping everything up to date. So if I was giving you guys an image, this is how I did this for the first five years of my lab. I would give everybody an image. Then over time, the dependencies in that image break. Everything, things get updated. It doesn't, a, a static image cannot hold its configuration for too long before it's a hassle. So we kind of had to go to an approach where it built in the cloud so that everything, when it builds, is building with the most up-to-date repositories of everything. So like that's kind of, that's what Good Actions was. It's a cloud building um, product that, that built the image that you used, which you guys could use to build a Raspberry Pi image in the future. So it's available. Next, we downloaded a handful of programs. What do those programs do? Why do you use those programs? Yeah. So one was a flash drive etcher to um, etch the image onto the SD card. Yeah. We had, um, you recommended Putty, which that one is the SSH client. Terminal, so yeah. That's how you get the terminal. Yeah. Um, you also recommended Sublime, which is essentially the text editor slash mm -hmm. IDE. Um, and then Putty. Is file transfer. Win SCP, but yes. Right, yes. Yeah, Win SCP would be file transfer. So those were kind of the, th the three main programs. Something to flash the image. So once you have that image, you have to write it to an SD card, which you guys did. You used a little SD card reader. We used uh, Putty, which is a which is a, like 30-year-old terminal client. It's actually really awesome. So that's how we SSH into the Raspberry Pi. So we gained access from our laptops into the Raspberry Pi itself. And then WinSCP was file transfer back and forth. And then I use WinSCP. I like WinSCP because if I open a file, a, a script on the Raspberry Pi, sort of on its side, and it opens on my computer, it opens in Sublime Text, and I can edit it. It looks pretty. And then I can save it, and it saves it back on the Pi. So even though I'm working on it on my computer, it is living on the Pi, and the edits are made on the Pi. Um, we also looked at VS Code. A lot of you, I think, are more familiar with that. It does, it does Putty and WinSCP together and probably a bunch of other things. People seem to really like VS Code. It was just developed after I learned these tools. And I, the ones I use, I think, are, are, are pretty happier with them. 
Um, okay, how did we connect to the Raspberry Pi? Somebody who hasn't answered. Yeah. Well, I use VS Code, so I don't know if, how different the processes are, but on VS Code, you can create like an SSH like access point by using the IP address that you get from the email. Yeah, so it's connection. And you use the IP address. So that told your computer what computer that it wants to talk to. It wants to talk to a computer at that IP address. The IP address is, is critical. Did anybody see something like a MAC address kind of in the emails? And anybody see that? Anybody know what a MAC address is and why we might want that in there? Yeah. Uh, it's like a hardware level address that is lower than the IP level. Yeah, so it's a fixed address of the Wi-Fi system on the Raspberry Pi that's unique to that Raspberry Pi. So every time we see a MAC address, we would actually be able to know which Raspberry Pi that came from. At least that all the Raspberry Pi messages with the same MAC address came from the same Raspberry Pi. So that's another way to know like who's sending what. Yeah. Does that mean like like if you swapped out an SD card on the same Raspberry Pi, it would always like the MAC address would be the same. And the IP address will gen well if you always boot in a similar area, like your IP address can stay the same for some time. If it connects to a different router, so there's a router right there and a router right there. So if I connect to that one, I'll have one IP address, and if I connect it to this one, I'll have a different IP address. So like they sometimes stay the same, they sometimes change. They're assigned by these routers. Um, okay. What was nano? And why is it useful? It's an editor that you can use within the terminal. Yes, it's an editor you can use inside the terminal. How do you save when you want to save something in Nano? You remember? Control O. Control O. And if you so Nano kind of takes over your terminal screen as an editor, you can kind of move back and forth with the arrows. One like kind of pro tip is if you right click, it will paste. So if you want to paste something into a terminal or into Nano. You can't use Control C, Control V, but you can copy it in from another location on your computer. So text is you would make a Word document, and then you can right-click on the terminal, and it'll paste it into the terminal for you. But yeah, Nano is a text editor. It's really, really useful when making small edits. So let's say you are at home and you want to have your email go to a different email address for some reason, and you could use Nano, go into the files, and change the email address that's sent, or add more email addresses. Things like that. It lets you like do some of the quick programming changes you might want to do. If you're making large programming changes, you'd probably do that through Sublime Text or WinSCP or VS Code. Why did, what, did, what did sudo do? It allows like, us to run user-secured programs, like higher level. Yeah, it runs it as administrator. Yeah. So if you like same thing on Windows, if you right click run it as administrator, that's the same thing. So what's great about sudo is it's it helps you do certain tasks, anything involving um, GPIO pins, so like anything involving the peripherals or external changes that might have to do with the Raspberry Pi will typically require sudo. Um, but you want to use sudo sparingly because it will let you do anything. Um, good, okay, some things involved, some things you had to run sudo. I forget what we were doing with maybe editing the Wi-Fi mailer or editing something. WPA supplicant required sudo, I think. So, so in those changes required sudo to be run in before nano. So sudo nano file. Who got the access point working? Can you can someone talk through it? Yeah, you want to talk through mm -hmm. it? I mean, um, what like the whole steps. Like first thing you had to do is like delete or create yeah. the typo. So talk through the whole thing. So going into nano, you had to delete the or you had to change the name of the wireless of the Wi-Fi so it wouldn't connect. And then um, once you boot it up, it makes its own like local uh, like Wi-Fi hotspot, which you then have to connect on your computer to. Yep. Um, and then once you connect with that, then you're able to basically um, run the same steps as, as if you connected it. Yeah. Then you're connected. What's different? Um, if you use the access point. I don't think I got an email. Yeah, there's so no email and no internet access because the network connection you have is from your computer to the Raspberry Pi. The internet's not a part of it. So if you're running the access point, there's no internet access, but you can still communicate. You might notice if you try to connect to the Raspberry Pi for an access point, you'll lose internet access on your computer too. 
unless you have a secondary Wi-Fi card. So the Wi-Fi card on your computer would be taken up by its connection to the Raspberry Pi, which doesn't have access to the internet. So if you use the access point, it, everything is the same, except you have no internet access. So if you don't get an email, how do you know the IP address? Um, you're actually directly connected to something and has a static one of localhost or 10.0.200, I think. Yeah, so we configured it such that whenever it boots into the access point, it always has the same IP address. So we'd never have to wonder what it is. It's always 10.0.0.200. The fact that it's 10 dot means that it's an access point. Great. Okay, and then you had to go back in and remove that typo and M wireless so that it would then reconnect M wireless. And that's what we did. So those of you that didn't do that, you're welcome to give it a try. It just will allow you to access the access point or let you like go through that process. Yeah. Suppose that like something went wrong when you did that and you didn't have the monitor around. Is you, are you would you kind of just be stuck? Yeah, yeah, you'd be stuck. I mean, so one thing that's kind of helpful that I kind of sometimes do. I mean, we don't usually get locked out of them. You know, like usually they work. Um, but one thing you can do is add your home or your cell phone hotspot to a relatively high priority, and then you turn your cell phone on. We'll connect to that and send you an email. So you can always turn that on. One like slight issue with that is if you have an iPhone, it creates a, a, a Wi-Fi network name. Mine's called Elliot's iPhone. There's an apostrophe in there. I don't know that we know. How, I don't know. At least at this point, I don't know how to do the apostrophe part. Like I can't get it to recognize an SSID with an apostrophe. So if anybody knows how to do that, let me know. I haven't spent too much time on it, so it might be easy. But that's one thing that still has to be sorted. Like you would, if you tried to add your phone's hotspot, you'd have to handle that. I was going to say, you can also just change your phone hotspot. You can also change your phone hotspot to SSID. Yes. Cool. Okay. So that was good. That was great, like a little recap of what we did yesterday. We're going to keep going and go through a little more depth. Any questions on that stuff? Okay. Okay. This is the like WinSCP version of the file layout. So if you enter, so we're at home slash pi. So that's your username. Everybody's username is the same. This is like your home directory for that user. It would be like your desktop for your username on, on Windows. There's a handful of files in here, folders. RG plot, that's a real-time plotter. We'll use that later. We're not going to worry about it now. Markify example code, that's just example scripts that have been built for Raspberry Pis in the past from our group. You're welcome to look at it, and like it gives you ideas of how to structure code, what uh, like kind of copy and paste style commands you can use. So that's just example code for your reference. Raspberry 11 is where we will operate out of, and then actuator package is a, also something you don't need to worry about. That's something we use for kind of a different for part of a research group. And so if I wanted to drag files back and forth, I could do that here. This is in my 3.11 directory. Say there. This is the root directory. So it has, this is kind of like backing all the way up. This is kind of the different folders. This contain information about the programs and, and the repositories that are installed, how, how it boots, what services are, are running, where your ports are located. So it just contains like information about the Raspberry Pi. You probably won't. Pretty low level information, you probably won't access this much. It's also like slash. We'll talk about like CD slash puts you here. This is sort of the root. There's like one option of root, and then there's one option of user, which is tilde. We'll go through that in a sec. Okay. These are just important file locations for you to have. <coughs> this is most of this is listed kind of in the repository itself. If you haven't read the repository, the 311 repository, the, the text that's in there, that's kind of helpful text, that's worth reading. It's not long, but it, it'll help make sure you're on board with everything that's going on. So these are just different file locations. The startup mailer, that's a Python file. Yeah. Um, 
Is Nano the only text editor that's available on the Raspberry Pi, or are there no, like there's others? Two. What's another one? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Vim is one that a lot of people use. I use Nano if I'm editing on the Pi. He's Nano. Yeah, I think he's Vim. No, I surely do not. Do you, yeah. what do you use? Pi slash Vim is, I think, has a steep learning curve. Um, but you can, like, once you get it, I think it's super useful. I've never decided to put that kind of effort in. I'm with Elliot. You know, works just well yeah. enough. Okay. So nah. just keep that in mind. Yeah. So there are others. I've always used Nano. Um, um, any other questions? So start a mail learn. That's a Python file. It's in et cetera. So you want to edit, for example, a text that's in your email, have it go to different emails. That information is in startupmailer.py. One great thing, like who has Python experience? There's like half of you. Great thing about Python is it's readable. You can look at it and read what's going on and it will, it will make sense. That's like one of the wonderful things of Python. So if you read that startup mailer script, my guess is you would sort of figure out what it's doing, even if you aren't familiar with the specific syntax. So I think that makes it easy for you to edit it. Plus, if you ever break it, you know, we can rebuild this any time. Wireless network configuration is in WPA supplicant. So that's within, et cetera, WPA supplicant. And then the file is called WPA supplicant wlan0.com. And this is actually a special file that we created. Normally, it would not have this dash wlan0 if you were just editing a regular Raspberry Pi. All that information would live in just WPA supplicant.com. But that's where you would add, let's say, your home Wi Fi network. You can, so if you didn't add it in that menu, you can still go in and add it. You can just add it directly to that file. Just You would look at the ones that are there and copy that syntax and put your information in, your SSID and your password. So that should work. Yeah, Rob 3.11 folder is in home slash pi slash Rob 3.11. We talked about that. Example Python files, real-time plotter, and ignore the actual package. OK. Common Linux commands. LS is a list of files. And if you're operating on the terminal, I'll do some of these in a minute. That LS lists the file in a directory. Dash A will show hidden files. CD, change directory. CD directory will change that directory. So if I did CD slash, CD space slash, it's going to put me in the home directory. Or it's going to put me in the root directory. If I do CD tilde, CD space tilde, it'll put me right into the home directory for Pi. If we want to make a directory, we can do that with mkdir. Touch will create a file name. We create a file. Cat will display it, kind of like nano, but it's not an editor. It's just displaying what, what the file is. Nano, this is our text editor we talked about. Ping is super helpful. If you do like ping www.google.com, it will start pinging. If you're connected to the internet, you can see packets being sent. So that's just a really quick way to tell, are you connected to the internet? It's just to ping something. If it times out, that you're not connected. And then this is how we shut down, sudo shut down now or sudo reboot. If you just kind of like pull the power out, it should be fine, but that can sort of do some corrupting on the Raspberry Pi. So it's better to shut it down from the terminal. There's a whole, who's looked at the cheat sheet of Linux commands? There's a whole cheat sheet of Linux commands. I'll, I can maybe pull it up in a second. But it has tons of commands that you might be interested in using. OK, so now I'm going like, to like, log into this Raspberry Pi, just kind of make sure you see all this. I'm going to do Raspi config, which is something we didn't do that you will have to do to your own Raspberry Pis. <coughs> so let me do that. So this thing has sent me. It's IP address. Okay. You guys all get this. You guys are going to edit your team name, put it there. Quick thing on team name, look at the sheet. A lot, of my, a lot of your teams don't have team names. Can you just create something and put it there like soon so we can sort of wrap that up? It doesn't have to be, it can be anything. So it doesn't, you can just use a number if you're not sure. 
but I'd like to kind of get all that sorted. So do that sheet, make sure it's filled out. A lot of you also like don't have some of your, your program you're in. Like that information is helpful. So if you guys could fill it out, that'd be awesome. Okay, so I have my IP address. Open Putty. Login as Pi as the default password. So here, if now we are in, what directory are we in? What do we call this? Home. So if I do ls, enter, then you can see these are the same folder structure we saw in WinSCP. So I can actually, let me show you on WinSCP at the same time. Host name, IP address. Okay, so ls does that. If I do cd slash, where's that going to take me home? I mean, that's going to take me to root. Now I'm back in the root directory. So this shows me like the same file structure we saw with etc. And if I look inside Rob311, I'm inside here. You kind of have some information. So this, what's inside Rob 311, we'll talk about like as the class goes on. So there's code in there for the Raspberry Pi, but there's also code in there for the Pico, which we haven't talked about, but you guys soldered on lab one. So we'll talk kind of as we get, as we move into the control, which will probably be like the second half of the class, that's when we'll kind of really begin to getting into the software on the control side. Until then, we're kind of still on the, making side, so we're going to talk about building things and designing <laughs> until we get, right now we're modeling, we did the thermal modeling, the transition modeling, then we select our motor, we'll go to the physical design, and then after physical design, we'll move to control, and that's when we'll start to use a lot of the software. So for now, just know that's the location of your files, but we're not going to talk about exactly what they are yet. Um, if I do ping, oops. So if I'm pinging Google, I should get things that look like this. This means it's connected. Like I'm getting response back. So it's telling us you know, 64 bytes from something. So I'm getting like response back. If it was saying timeout, and I was just saying like timed out a few times, and that's not connected. It'll just keep doing that. If I do CD dot dot, that backs up one level. So that's like the little in File Explorer that would back you up one, cd dot dot. Um, Let's make a directory. How should I do that? How, oh, what was the command for making a directory? You guys remember? So I just made a directory called test. We'll go into test. Now if I back this out and refresh, Our test directory is there, there's nothing in it. So we could just do so I just created a little text file. If we wanted to edit it, we could do nano. Control O, like one thing for Nano that you guys gotta, you guys gotta look out for is like these commands at the bottom. Uh, those, those little commands are kind of telling you what's going on. If I do Control O, it says name to 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 write. What is the file name? It already has a file name, so it's pre-populated. So if I hit just Enter, it says one line. That means it's saved. So that's key. You gotta use these, like use these this menu down here. 
It'll kind of guide you for what's going on and how to use nano if you're not so sure. So we have hello world. Now if we do cat. So, if I, so you can sort of display what's going on, but there's not really anything in it. I think that's what I wanted to show you. Is there anything else we want to show? I think that's basically it. OK. So this is kind of like what we, all I wanted to show you kind of on recapping Lab 2, trying to make you comfortable with these tools, and comfortable with the Linux command line. Everybody's, everybody's good and happy? Feel like you're learning? OK. Awesome. Oh. I didn't do Raspi config. I gotta do that. Um, let's go back. So it told me I have to run that as root. If I do sudo raspi config, going to give me this window setting. For, this is a lot like a graphical interface for updating lots of settings in the Raspberry Pi. We have system options, display, interface, performance, localization, advanced. Is SPI an advanced or system? Interface. Which one? Interface. Interfaces. OK, so what we want to do, these are things that we're going to go over later. But what these are, SPI and ITC, those are different communication protocols. Those are kind of buses that we're going to use, digital buses like USB, but not USB, called ITC or SPI. All we want to do right now is just make sure it's enabled. Would I like the SPI interface enabled? Yes. That's it. So that has to be done. SPI interface is enabled. That's it. You can also like overclock in here. You can make these Raspberry Pis run faster than they're meant to be run, but then it might have some issues, so I wouldn't do that. These ones, we used to do that a lot, but the, the newer ones get really hot. This one actually has a heat sink on it, a secondary heat sink. OK, now you're good. You guys got to do Raspberry config, right, and enable your SPI bus. Who feels like they can do that? Yay. OK, good. I think you can do it, too. OK, so this is kind of like what we just did. Sometimes when I create the PDFs, it adds like white boxes. Oh, I lost my connection. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but last lecture there was like some white one of the slides with like a big white space, and I kind of drew a line at the bottom. Like I went back and looked, like whether that was in my file, and it's not. So somehow, sometimes when I create PDFs, <coughs> sometimes when I create PDFs, it like adjusts the formatting a little bit. So. I'll try to prevent that right now. I'm not sure how that's happening. It just did it right here. OK. All right, so we're done with labs. Now going back to this modeling, we're going through this framework. We've modeled, we've talked about getting our task requirements, talked about how transmission affects those, so the requirements on the output of the motor. Then we looked at how to model from the output of the motor to the current of voltage required input to the motor. And we are using that to design a system or to choose the proper components. This is done before we do physical design, so we know what to build. We also like talked a little bit about forward and inverse models. I just kind of wanted to touch back on that since I got a few questions about that after class. So like these two types of models, a forward model is, is solving the differential equation that goes from kind of effort to flow, or torque, to velocity, or motion. So it goes from the inputs of effort to the outputs of motion. And that is a, that's a standard way to solve these problems in a 
something like Simulink in an ODE solver. So we call these causal because they only use information from the present or past, and they use integration. So you would build a Simulink model that integrated instead of differentiated, and that's super common. You guys have probably seen that in many other classes. Inverse models require like a numerically differentiated flow variable. So velocity or position or acceleration. And to numerically differentiate something, we have to take its slope. When you take its slope, you're sort of using information from the future. And it actually works pretty well these days because we can sample systems really fast and actually have like really clear pictures of what's happening even after the instant that it's happening. <clears throat> so it's an, it is non-causal, meaning it's not physically realizable. You couldn't, it doesn't, you couldn't constrain the system this way. You can only go the, you only go the forward way. But it is a good approximation of the underlying mechanics. So we can use it for kind of understanding the mechanics. We couldn't use it to, to build a lifelike simulation. Cool. Most of the time, you guys are probably doing forward models. The only reason we're not doing that is because we can't. We have an output set of requirements in flow. Yeah. Can you kind of mix together a forward and inverse model and use both, or? No, because like usually one of, if it depends on what your unknown is. If your unknown is motion, then use a forward model, start with effort, go to flow. If your unknown is flow, then you start with, if your unknown, in this case, actually it's effort, and we knew flow. So we took motion and differentiated it. If you were doing both, you'd either have two sets of unknowns or two sets of knowns. So like you couldn't really merge them. They kind of solve different issues about what you have access to. Then another thing that we discussed was that there are two degrees of freedom in the system. And so in order to do this simulation, we have to prescribe motion not just for one degree of freedom, but for both. And that brought up another sort of issue of we don't actually know, at least not yet, we don't know the right lean angle for the, the velocity profile we were getting at. We know like generally what it looks like, but we don't know the exact value yet. Like we might, I think we can go back and calculate it, but that's for the future. So we approximated it with something that made sense. That's a second issue. Like that would sort of loosen the, the realism of the simulation. So is the simulation perfect? No. Is the sim simulation good enough to help us select a motor and a transmission? Definitely. So that's why we do it and learn it this way in this class. It's for selecting components, even under the in the face of limitations. And this problem is particularly sophisticated. So like normally when we model like this, it's not quite so sophisticated. Okay. Cool. I'm going to keep going. We talked about we're learning a planar model of a ball lot. We want to model its mechanics. We can predict the torque required. We're going to reduce this three-dimensional system into one plane with one wheel and one motor. We thought of this as... We talked about the, the similarities and differences to the actual ball bot, and since there's only one wheel here or one motor, these are gonna overestimate the torque needed. So we think of that as kind of a worst case scenario to benchmark our motor selection, a conservative estimate. In order to do this, we need like parameters, we need to understand the physical properties of our system. We've listed these for you, those might come, if you were building your own robot, you'd be looking those up in data sheets or measuring them with scales. But you usually need some understanding of, of what you're doing to do this analysis. So we would look those up or measure them. We did that, and they're listed. <clears throat> we talked about motion, the different variables here, and the different variables associated with kind of each component, the body or the chassis, which leans forward and back. So it only has sort of one degree of freedom for one set of motions. In this case, it's, it's theta x or theta y, since these planes are identical after we listed both. <coughs> wheel motion. Wheel motion we defined as psi, so that's the actual literal rotation of the wheels. But wheel motion is affected by the lean angle. So if it's leaning, then we can't 
we have to include the concept of lean angle into, the, into the, our understanding of what, what psi is or wheel rotation is. So wheel motion also depends on body lean angle. And then ball motion was our x of k or y of k, that's sort of linear displacements. And then it also has a rotation, which we called phi. So it's rolling. Cool? <coughs> This we kind of used to discuss uh, the constraints and the degrees of freedom, but the constraints here I think are the most important. We had two constraints. So we originally had four degrees of freedom. We reduced it to two by using these two constraints. This constraint says the basketball does not slip on the floor. So we know that x of k is related to phi by the radius rk. Nothing kind of crazy. The tangential velocity constraint at bc it's a little more sophisticated, and this is what takes into account both the rotation of the wheel or the ball, which, which will affect the rotation of the wheel, but also the movement of the body, how the body is rolling back and forth. So that, account, that expression accounts for the velocity of the interface in the face of both the ball rolling and the chassis rolling. So those, are, those would be something that you would solve with like paper and pencil from a rather like challenging dynamics problem which we're going to kind of get back to later. Then we began to talk about prescribing motion. We're going to have to figure out a motion profile. When we're selecting our, our system, we want to select based on a motion profile that makes sense for our application. So as a designer, you select this. You would select the motion profile that you want, and that what would guide you to build that motion profile is what you actually wanted to do. I moved the wrong slide forwards. And what we wanted it to do is roll one meter per second, which we found was a reasonable, maybe a little fast, but a reasonable ball velocity. So that gave us, okay, we have a constant we wanted to approach. Now we're going to create an increasing velocity profile to meet that one meter per second. And we had some, like in the, in the code, which we're going to go over, we had some ability to control this acceleration. And the faster we make that acceleration, the more demand it's going to be on the system. So there's some, you have to create this, and there's some kind of intuition you want to apply when creating it, both considering your task and the influence of this on the ball, the ball bot design. I smoothed it, so this had sharp corners in blue, then I smoothed it, which we'll see in Malab, which is just a running moving average filter, and it makes it a little smoother. Sharp corners are not good for this analysis because we're taking numerical derivatives. Okay. We also talked, to, talked about that we, if we look at these, we can probably get a gut feeling for the current voltage profiles that we're going to see. That's a gut check for it. These are right. Acceleration, we thought would be proportional to current, which is proportional to, to torque. Velocity should be proportional to voltage. We talked about this lean angle, which, we, which really is something that we can potentially physically define. We're going to get back to that. But for now, we know the lean angle is proportional to the torque that's applied to the ball. If it's leaning, it's accelerating. There's a net torque applied. We'll see that when we actually start driving them. So we know that it generally should lean with acceleration, but we don't know exactly that right value, so we just scaled it to something that looks about reasonable. And I think four degrees is about the maximum that it's ever going to be able to do. After four degrees, the torque gets too high, slash the balls, the wheels begin to lose contact. So we're going to end up living in this world of kind of plus or minus four degrees, four degree cone of kind of balancing. We began to talk about the mechanics, the forces on the system, which looks scarier than it actually is. Lots of forces at play here. But only one force matters. Which force is it? We're talking about what we're trying to calculate is the torque on the wheel. Can you guys read these? Which force is the only force that matters? Tx. Yeah, that's true. But we're trying to say like Tx in terms of the forces. There's only one force that doesn't go through the center of that ball, which is Fw2. So if we can find an expression for FW2, we know how to calculate torque at the wheel. 
if we do our Newton second law and do a bunch of algebra, we can get an expression for FW2 in terms of an, uh, just kind of intermediate variable that was used to make it all easier to write. We have our constraints. We can determine the ball velocity, which then we can differentiate. So we did kind of did this, at least kind of talked through it. That resulted in expressions solved for current of voltage that looks something like this. So here what we've done is leave everything in terms of the output of the transmission. So that means the transmission occurs in this expression a bunch of times because we didn't create these relationships that say the velocity of the transmission is n times the output velocity. We just said always n times the output velocity. So all of these are our size with n's. This was the torque to roll the ball. This is the torque to accelerate the rotor's inertia. This is the torque to fight viscous loss. We divide by kT to find the actual current. So this is sum of torques equals this, this torque provided by the motor. And then we compute the, the voltage drop using KVL, which is straightforward. So from this, we could actually predict the current and voltage needed, and it looked something like this. So same information, now I just used the uh, XK that we defined to actually calculate the current voltage. Anybody know where these bumps are from? It has to do with the smoothing. Does it look weird to you? Or like, how comfortable are you that there are those little bumps in there? What does that, what does that tell you? Yeah. Isn't it something with the differentiation in MATLAB? Like those are certain like cutoff points. You're like trying to connect like piecewise. Or is it all one continuous function? It's all one continuous function, but it does have to do with you're on the right track. Yeah. Um, was it with the like how like the smoothing that you're doing where like initially there were like edges that don't work well, so when you like smooth it and then I guess somehow I don't know why, but MATLAB like made it bumpy. <laughs> yeah, this is right. There's a, like I can tell you exactly what it is, but it's, that's that's how that's it. So like when we're smoothing with a moving average filter, we're smoothing a ramp function. So for you, it goes this way. So we're smoothing it by taking a window, a moving average window that's 500 points long, and averaging it, and just keeps going. The first part is all zeros. The second part is all ones. <laughs> So if we're smoothing something that's all zeros, it's going to be zero, zero, and then the first time it reaches the actual part where it starts to go up, it'll have a non-zero value. And then that's discontinuous. So it's going to go from zero to something non-zero, and then we take the derivative of that. And that's what you see. It's the derivative taken of that tiny difference. So it's not really something you'd be able to see from your eyes, but it's something that when you take its derivative, you see that spike <coughs> where it all of a sudden started it had like went from zero velocity to a non-zero velocity in an instant. So that's what that is. That just comes from the smoothing. I actually did, instead of smoothing, we could filter with a low-pass filter, which is, you know, smoothing is the same thing as a low-pass filter. We could use a real low-pass filter, which I did, but it got, it was like, it got a little crazier, so I just left it with this. But it's still in the code. I'll show it to you. Yeah. So why is there a third one at the, at the end? Or like there's... Yeah, like at the very end, there's that like third one at the bottom. There should be four. Yeah, there's four, but why is there one at the end specifically, like if it smooths out? At the end, it would be the exact, the rationale would be exactly the same. Oh, okay. Because like it's going to go from a slope of zero, so where velocity is one, but at some point that it's going to kind of come to a place where there's the next step is all ones. Step before that is not, has a non zero average or non one average. So like no matter what, you'll get this discontin discontinuity whenever it reaches the flat sections. Okay. And that even that includes yeah, the, the ramp section, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, for the current equation, we have like Tx in there. Is Tx a constant, or are we getting that from the values of how fast we're supposed to be moving? We're getting that from here. OK, so we are using that force. OK, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, we're using that force. And then just keep bringing it over to torque. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, I should probably like add that. I'll add that. Like, that's why I was, I was pretty sure yeah. that's where it was coming from. I was just confused just, if it or if it was a constant or something. Yeah, it equals uh, R W times F W two. Okay. So what I want to do now is kind of show you the M file that created this. Walk you through it. I'd like you guys to open it at the same time. So this is the, this is the M file that would be like the end of the motor selection, but for stuff which we'll do very soon maybe today but so like this is a this is kind of like the culmination m file of all of the analysis we've been talking about for two and two and a half lectures so you guys could go to files I think I created something that's called files used in lecture or something. Let me actually see if I can find it. <coughs> it's in files for lecture. Lecture four. There's a lot of files in here. What's what we're talking about now is Rob 311 1D ball by example. You'll need this. And you'll need DDT. DDT is a gift for you guys. It's a really awesome numerical differentiator. It fits a function with five points, fits a second order polynomial, numerically differentiates that second order polynomial at the current time step. It's really it's a high quality way of performing derivatives. It doesn't change the length of your signal. So it receives, it would be DDT of your signal, comma, your time step. That's how you use it. So you'll need both of those. And this is what it should look like. You should see something like this. Anybody not have it up? Okay, so let's kind of like talk through this. Is there a way to zoom this in in MATLAB? You guys know? Like make my editor bigger? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. All right, so. First thing, so I have it like heavily commented, including like both kind of like headers that look like this, and then every line is, every relevant line should have a comment next to it. So the first thing we do is just set up our, our ball bot parameters. That's that same slide. <coughs> Physical properties, that goes in there. We're gonna need that stuff. Here we have motor parameters. This information came from a website, colombo.com, slash products, slash the motor we're using in this all bot. So you need, in order to run these analyses, you need motor properties. Okay. For this particular motor, it has a transmission ratio of 70. So N is 70, we're gonna say it has 80% efficiency. And then we compute the stall torque, the, the stall current, or the stall torque, and then also it lists the stall current and stall voltage. It lists the no load speed, and, and it provides the voltage applied, which we call the nominal voltage. Pololo is a little bit weird in that they provide the specifications for this as the output of the transmission instead of the output of the motor. So the, I've never seen this before except for Pololo because you're buying it basically as one gear motor system. So that's why like these are divided, that stall torque is divided by 70 because that comes from the out, that's the stall torque of the output of the transmission. So I'm just dividing it by 70 so it's more appropriate for the actual motor itself. Same thing with KT and all, all these other things. So all this comes from their <coughs> website. The only thing I had to kind of look up was L and J. Sometimes it's hard to find that information, so you can either like approximate it. I approximated J as something like a third the, the 
uh, inertia of a similarly dimensioned Maxon motor. That was, long, that was three times longer. So like, I kind of just used my resources to get a, something I thought was a reasonable approximation. This is the velocity profile generation. So this is exactly what we saw when we were smoothing it. So it just builds, we have our final velocity. That's the end of the simulation. It's gonna run for 10 seconds. That's the time at which the velocity goes constant at one meter per second. So it's be constant or constant. This is all like actually, it's the same variables from the slide that shows this. DT, where you have 200 hertz sampling rate. That's what your ball bot will eventually run on, 200 hertz. So this just builds, this just builds the trajectory. So you guys would have to do that at some point. It builds and plots it. And then smooths it. So here's the other, so if you look at this line here, that line uses a low pass filter instead of smoothing in it. The problem is that function does low pass filtering two directions, called a zero phase filter, and then it makes it get crazy. So I went back to smoothing. These are just creating the variables. So we're numerically differentiating x dot to get it, <coughs> x k dot to get its acceleration. We're numerically integrating it to get x of k. Plot the acceleration. Here's where we create the lean angle. We have to, that's our secondary input. And you can see there's my scale factor that I was talking about. And it says there's some constraints. We want this to be approximately four degrees. Plot the lean angle. Then here, like it's just creating variables. Here's the actual code to find the torque. It's just gamma FW2. There's really only like two lines that do the hard stuff. Everything else is kind of like numerical differentiation and such. These are the constraints. Here's, here's the torque, that expression for torque. So if I run this, it's going to create Gonna, you know, make all these plots, lean angle, torque, <clears throat> current and voltage. What I want you guys to do is mess around with this M file. Change the, change the different conditions, change the torque constant, <coughs> change the input parameters. So change the velocity it has to go to, start to like change inertia. I want you guys to like for the next five minutes or so, Look through the SEM file, change things, try to get a handle on like what happens when you change, you know, what happens to Y when you change X. Does that seem okay? I'm gonna walk around and like kind of help you do this. We're just gonna, this is mostly to get you familiar with this. And then after this, we're gonna do this example for the rest of class. So you're gonna, I'm going to want you in a minute to create an M file that, looks, that does this. So that's the next step. So right now I just want you to, to get a feel for the different steps, like look through it, feel it, like feel if you're under, un, if you're comfortable understanding what the functions are and what they're doing. And then if not, talk to me and let's make sure. We're gonna do it. Yeah. Um, there was an error when I tried to run it, and it says I'm missing like a, a function or variable called filter 22. Oh, uh, okay. No, that's you need, okay. That's mine. You need that. I'm gonna give you filter 22. I'm about to put it into the canvas folder. So let's just take like five minutes for this. This is going to be rel relatively quick, and we're going to have you solve a problem. Yeah. What do you mean? Um, like not numerically, like just directly doing the math. I think like MATLAB also supports doing that. You have to have like known expressions, and like, rather than curves, you have to have like known close form expressions for everything, which is harder. But you can do that. That is definitely true. You can do that. But if you look at our signals, they don't look like common signals. 
that are easily like, differentiated from smart. Does that make sense? It's not a sine wave. Okay. So, like, um, so I'm just thinking, like, for the profile we're trying to follow, is it to be diagnosed yet or easily, or is it like something that is difficult to? It would be something that would be difficult to differentiate in close form. Because mm -hmm. I don't know, you have to find a mathematical expression for it. There are, it is possible. Yeah, I feel like I've just maybe got a bit confused about like, what we're doing here. Like, do we start with the profile? I thought we, like, there's p prescribed profiles that are like, relatively simple. You want to you yeah. create, you, have, you need a model to predict the torque so you can size your system. Yeah. So then you need you know, a model that predicts torque required to have the motion. So then you would create a motion variable yeah. that is sort of consistent with what you want the real life to be. <coughs> you would run that through your model, Newton's second law, to get your torque, and then you use your torque to decide things. Which plan That's how it works. We've talked about what that model is and creating the inputs. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I should just look at the code. Okay. All right, that sounds good. Um, I mean, that should. I, it's heavily commented. I think it should be. What's the thing? Okay. Um, Let's make this body huge. Okay, good. Doing. <laughs> Do you like some file? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, it's good. Okay. Very good. Where's the voltage for four? Uh, we're doing yeah. six. Cool. I, I think I sort of understand now. Like, so from this, um, where we generate the velocity profile, uh, do we first like start with something simple and then you use like you know, thirty volts, ten meters out? Yeah, that's what I did. So. <laughs> And that would probably like, make it difficult to differentiate. Like, yeah, we have to find the close well, to Like, suppose if you use something like an S curve or something that has like a very well behaved formula. Then it's really easy. It's a can, really. Not just leaving those two I wouldn't do that. Because, like, that's that, the thing you're saying, like, I made the basketball. Oh, because it changed the acceleration. Like, yeah. Make, that would just oh. make this more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ball is humongous. <laughs> meters. <laughs> Ten meters. Sweet. One hundred fifty kilograms. Yeah. It follows the equations that are like in the slide that we went over. Okay, broke it. Exactly. My thoughts. So it pretty much these ones. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That stuff should be in there. Exactly. Okay. Good. What was it the initial part? Remember? Here, I can have it up right now. You need to download that other program. Like we talked about like the filter 22, you need that. Lesson. So download off Canvas and put it in that same folder. It's got this. Not more sturdy. Why did it, so I made the, um, the final, the max speed 10 meters per second, and now but like it starts to dip a little bit. Do you know why it's doing that? Like as opposed to like kind of a, a steadier, um, like. Can we look at your, your other curves? Yeah. It's like hitting like a max, and uh, I don't know. Actually. <laughs> okay, have you tried this? Oh, let's see. Oh, so it is from 2.5 to 2.5 to 6 seconds. Matches up. It's hard to, I'm not sure. Like, it's hard to say. There's a lot of different factors going on. Like, when you start changing these things, like they, and we go through them one by one to kind of really look at like what, yeah. what that is. I was just curious. Um, I need to go up if you can. Oh, 
much now. I had to think about it. Uh, yeah, but yeah, no, like this, is, just, yeah. this is kind of the idea is that you mess with these things and kind of get this mapping of like what changes what. Mm -hmm. You can also like, for example, plot the individual terms of a torque. Uh -huh. And that will kind of tell you like, okay, this is when. This is when. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned up the velocity to 100. Max velocity. So like you're, yeah, like eventually it will sort of not make sense. Yeah. <laughs> it can't, there's no way for things like that to happen. Like I can't lean, for example, far enough to get that torque. So you, yeah, yeah. at some point we sort of know we're, we're doing something <laughs> that's not physically realizable. And that's, this comes from more from the fact that there's two inputs. Like your inputs both need to agree with each other, and then they, at this point they would they wouldn't be. So you could start by changing the profile to see that's like a seven radians. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a new one. The two input, the two input. Oh, I guess once you well, pass two like, pi radians. Yes, yeah, oh makes wait, sense. is seven more than two pi? No, it's not. It is more. Yeah, I can watch it. So you have to like like. Do you all the way around. No, he's not Plus one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what if I need to add the 100? Here's my second at the end. Awesome. Let's start back with the third. Childish, Ben. I'll provide you sources of that last. What about like Jupiter? Thank you. Yeah. Whoa, you need 100 volts. Yeah. Might have found a glitch. But Lena just stays the same. Ooh, what is it? What is that? Gravity. 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 Why is it not really bad that far? It's Because it's the same, like, oh, you yeah. the lean angle. Turn one and make it LW. I think the lean angle right, is proportional to velocity. Change that at the bottom. Good catch. I don't think it, my guess is it won't affect. Yeah. Like 0.7, 100 was like a little over 7. Let's see. Let's, let's do some trick. We increase the lean angle. Good catch, though. Did you guys hear that? I have two variables called L. So one of them's overwriting the other one, and they're off by a factor of 10. So we want, in order to make this right, we want to separate those. <laughs> I'm calling them the motor's inductance, LW, maybe LM, because of wheel. So LM, and then all I did is down here in the motor voltage equation, I just added that subscript M, and then it does it. There, actually, the values were close enough that it doesn't affect much. That could catch. There's the one on line 39. Where's the other L? One of nine. So, but the first L is line 10 or line 18. Yeah. This is, so, first L is here. Second L. Nope. So by giving the motor like zero resistance and making it ideal. Yeah, like you could definitely see like what that was. That's a good thing to like check and get a feel for. Okay. One thing I that's a little bit to make, like, about the simulation is that there's the two inputs, and those two inputs kind of have to agree with each other. So, for example, like if you tell it to accelerate really hard, but you then also tell it that it's not going to lean very much then those would not agree, and the simulation would sort of fall apart, or you know, there would be more error in the simulation. So that's why I kind of said this one's a little bit more tricky. We're going to move to a 1D example, a, just an example very similar to your homework. Just made the lean angle point zero zero one. It's not two degrees of freedom, so we won't have any of those caveats. <coughs> All right, this is what we're going to do the rest of class. This is a, let's say you want to build this thing.
Okay. Let's say you want to build this thing. So let's say this is a robot. You guys decide. Or maybe you're hired by a catapult making company after you graduate. Now, if you want to make this awesome giant catapult, we need to understand what motor and transmission ratio to put here. So we have a lever arm, there's a catapult on the end of it. If we want to figure this out, we know we have mass of 10 kilograms in, in the ball, length of one meter, efficiency of 0.8. What would we do? What would we start with? <clears throat> Yeah. Free body diagram. The free body diagram. That would be great. We're going to skip that. That's true. That's definitely the good thing, the thing to start with. We're going to skip that in the interest of time and in in because some people are not MEs that haven't seen that before. We're going to go straight to the equations. What equations do we need? What do we want? What are we doing here? We want torque. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, let's and we can just do some of the torques. So let's do some torques about this thing. So we want to know maybe what the motor's doing. <coughs> so we have kT times i. That's what the torque the motor has to do. What is it going to have to do? What's one of the things that it has to do? Hold up the weight of the sphere or whatever is going to cost. Just to hold it up against gravity. That's right. So there's a there's a, a mass in this catapult. We're actually going to have it start here and go up to 70 degrees. So yeah, there's a mass there. That mass has to fight that weight of that mass. So we're going to say that's minus. You know the equation for that weight? Something like minus mgl cosine theta over eta n. So this is mgl cosine theta. That's our torque. <coughs> Divided by eta n. That's now on the, on the input side from the motor. Input to the transmission. We've now reduced it. So that's accounting for that transmission, yeah. What is the first term in the denominator? That's beta. Oh. And what is? It's this. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> what's, another, what's another thing it has to do? If it wants to launch this ball. It against gravity, the weight pulling it down. What else does it have to do? Yeah. Yes, fight the friction and with the wheels and the... Uh, in the motor. Yeah, that's a fight friction. So we're going to say that's B theta dot N. So it has some viscous loss defined by this damping parameter B. And we want to capture its velocity. Well, its velocity is going to be N times theta. So theta is the output. That's this part here. What else? Another one, yeah. Inertia of the arm. Inertia of the arm. So how would we account for that? We're like, so the inertia of the arm. Rod rotating the pen. Yes. That's how, that's how we'll do it. But what about the transmission? How will the transmission affect that inertia? <clears throat> we'll divide it by n squared. It's going to reflect that inertia by n squared. So it's going to be j of the motor plus ml squared over n squared and get a double dot. The motor, kt times i, has to produce the, the torque required to have gravity pulling down on the end of the catapult, fight friction, by the viscous loss, and it accelerate inertia. It's got to accelerate its own inertia, and then it's got to accelerate the inertia of the end of the catapult, but it's going to see that inertia reflected by n squared. So we're going to divide it by n squared because on the motor side, 
it sees the output inertia, the load inertia, divided by n squared. Great. And then V equals, this one's pretty straightforward, IWR plus KT N theta dot plus L DT. Here's what I want you to do for the next 10 minutes. 10 minutes, and then after, then like after class. This is a good exercise. What I want you to do is create an M file. In the folder on Canvas, there's a student, there's a like Rob311 example student. Open that and write in it. What it will do is provide you with a variable theta. It'll give you the theta. So I created the kinematics for you. I gave you like what the task is. The task is to launch this thing from zero degrees to 70 degrees. So I provided you with theta. I provided you with dt and t. And I provided you with theta dot. So if you open that M file, it's going to have the start of this. So I can load these things. It's going to set up a few variables. What I want you to do now is implement these equations with one thing that actually that's important. What are we missing here? What haven't we talked about in this example? What's KT? We haven't talked about that. Also uploaded is a motor <coughs> Excel sheet. In that Excel sheet, it's probably like 100 motors. What I want you to do is pick one of those motors and complete this example with one of the motors from the Excel sheet. You guys have 10 minutes to do this. We're going to walk around for 10 minutes, and the class is over. So this is where we're going to stop. We're not actually going to get to, to thermal. That's OK. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about the direction for the first for the torque equation. Yeah. Um, so I can see like the uh, the mass causing it to go in like the opposite direction of where it's trying to go, which is negative. But wouldn't mm -hmm. if it's trying to like move clockwise, wouldn't uh, friction also be fighting against it and then be in the same direction as that? Um. Yeah. So wouldn't those have the same? I think they should. I think that that is right. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's right. Good catch. Let me see what that does to the solution. So you guys should have the, stu the student example file pulled up. Yeah, then you should be looking at that motor spreadsheet. Do you guys want me to show that motor spreadsheet to you? Yeah. It looks like this. Across the top, these are different motors, <coughs> a bunch of different models of motors. We use these motors, like we use this in our research group. These are motors that are like approximately scaled to the things that we do. So they'd be, they're gonna be way more powerful than the motors you're using in a ball lot. But these are the kind of motors we use, and these are the different characteristics depending on the data sheet that we found it from. They either, you know, some have more or less information. <laughs> if there's anything that you don't have that you need, just make it up. One that we use a lot is the first one. This is our like most common motor that we use. But go ahead and take a look through, kind of pick one and run with it. Let me see how that sign change affects my program. Doesn't affect much. Mm. 
Oh, it might become from the model. Oh, right. when you load them. Okay. Them. Okay. When you load that. Uh, Remember, when you run the script, it will load some variables that I've created for you. Yeah, but how, how do I see, like, so what variables we even have a data, though? Yes. The modeling example, man. I didn't download it. Yeah. 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 Y
Just run that. Okay. Run that and it should give you a couple variables which you do need. Okay. Yeah, no, that. You take a note with picking your motor. It's like four letters. You pick an N. No, no, you have to like. Let's just select something that you think is good. So if it has like hundreds of currents or bolts. So wait, we shouldn't choose the transmission ratio that's on the sheet. Like, like the I um, was using the first motor, and it has like a transmission ratio. Yeah, yeah. It says for a 20 newton meter output. Oh, that's for, the, is that the, and that, what you were calling? <coughs> and that's on the right, the 0.81? Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it has like a value inside for the transmission. Don't worry, transmission. don't worry about that. That's that's not for this. Okay. Wait, so once you load the map value, you just pick a spreadsheet and then like fill in the other stuff? Yes. Okay. So you really pick a transmission ratio. Okay. So, as a reminder, oop, we're out of time. We're basically out of time. But as a reminder, well, maybe we'll pick up this. Would you guys like to continue this exercise next week? Okay. So we'll pick up this, ex this exercise next week and we'll. We'll do it kind of more thoroughly. I'll actually probably like, the files are fine, but I'll repost these lectures with a, with a sign change. Okay. On Tuesday, enjoy your weekend, do your homework, come to office hours.